peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and make a path for his steps. The word of the Lord. And now we will stand for the singing of the Alleluia. Shattered rocks ahead of the Lord, 
but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind came an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, there was a quiet, whispering voice. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his coat, went out, and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, Lord God of armies, I have eagerly served you, but the Israelites have abandoned your promises, torn down your altars, and executed your prophets. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to take my life. The Lord told him, Go back to the wilderness near Damascus, the same way you came. When you get there, anoint Hazael as king of Aram, anoint Jehu as king of Israel, and anoint Elisha as prophet to take your place. If anyone escapes from Hazael's sword, Jehu will kill him. And if anyone escapes from Jehu's sword, Elisha will kill him. But I still have 7,000 people in Israel whose knees have not knelt to worship Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in our story today, Elijah is having a bit of a hearing problem. Elijah is having a hard time determining who to listen to, which voices are trustworthy, which messengers are bearing news which he should pay attention to. In our story today, Elijah is coming off of the greatest victory of his career. Elijah had just seen God demonstrate with great power that God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the true God, not Baal, whom Israel has been worshipping. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel are followers of Baal, and Israel has been going after them. And Elijah, it seems at times, is all alone against these impossible odds. The story of his victory is probably a familiar one. Uh, Elijah challenges the 450 prophets of Baal to a sort of a duel, a competition, to see which god is the god that should be worshipped. So he says that we will make two altars, we'll put two sacrifices on them. One will be for Baal, one will be for Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And whichever God, Elijah says, call or sends fire down first to consume the sacrifice, well that God is the one that should be worshipped. So he lets the 450 prophets of Baal go first, and they build an altar, and they put their sacrifice on it, and they, they pray, and they dance, and they do everything they can think of, and they Baal send fire down. But of course, nothing happens. So then it's Elijah's turn, and he builds his altar, and he puts the sacrifice on it, and not content to just leave it at that, he pours water over it again and again, until the whole thing is just drenched in water. And then he prays a simple prayer, and immediately fire falls from heaven and consumes the sacrifice and the altar and everything around it. Elijah is lifted up as a hero. All the people who are there turn from Baal to Yahweh, we are told, and the 450 prophets of Baal are killed. Elijah is a victor. He's a hero at this point. And it's strange, then, that at the beginning of our story, all it takes is one little word, one little messenger from Jezebel, the queen of Israel, to make him forget all that has just happened. One messenger comes to Elijah and tells him that Jezebel will make him like one of those prophets that he killed by this time tomorrow, she says. And Elijah seems to forget all that happened. He seems to forget God's uh, presence with him, God's power that was just demonstrated through him just earlier that day or a few days before. And he fears for his life and he flees out into the wilderness. And he sits under a broom plant and he wishes that he were dead. He's ready to give up. And he lays down hopeless and goes to sleep. Elijah's having a bit of a hearing problem. Perhaps we can relate to Elijah. Perhaps we can relate to the experience of not knowing which voice to listen to, not knowing which messages are trustworthy, which messengers are from God. Perhaps we also know what it is to be confused and unsure of what is true. I know we 
had moments in our lives, I'm sure that we've had moments in our lives when we felt God's presence, where we've just known that God was with us, that God loved us. I'm sure that there have been times, even if they weren't as fantastic as fire falling from heaven, wherein we knew that God was powerful and able to do what He was promising to do. I know that we have had times where it was easy to believe those promises, where it was easy to tell which voices were from God and which were not. But I imagine for most of us, for me anyways, those moments are few and far between, and they're fleeting when they come. More often than not, we live amidst confusion. There are so many voices around us, so many messages and messengers, that it can be hard to know which messages are trustworthy and which ones are not. It's hard to know which voices are trustworthy and which ones are not. <coughs> There are so many voices promising so many things. They make promises of success, if only we work hard enough or wear the right clothes. They make promises of popularity or status if we only own the right car or make our house look a certain way. Promises of happiness if we only purchase enough toys or buy the right dog food or believe in ourselves or drink the right beer. Everywhere we turn, we hear voices telling us what we must do to be happy and popular and successful. We hear promises of happiness being given to us, promises that in the end do not satisfy. Whether we turn on the TV or open books and magazines or the computer, we see things that are designed to make us worry, to make us live in fear. We're told what we are supposed to be afraid of and the sorts of things we're supposed to buy to protect ourselves from those fears. Everywhere we look, we hear voices and messages and messengers, and it is so easy for the voice of God to get lost in the shuffle. Everywhere we turn, we find voices telling us to put our trust in things or in ourselves rather than in God and in the community that He has given us. We, too, like Elijah, have a bit of a hearing problem. God, in the wilderness, begins to address Elijah's hearing problem by sending him another messenger, a messenger to counteract that messenger which Jezebel sent him. This messenger, rather than being a bearer of a message of death, is a messenger of life. He tells Elijah to get up and eat. He provides food and water for Elijah to sustain him on his journey. Then we're told it's the messenger of the Lord. Other translations might say the angel of the Lord. Angel and messenger are the same word in the Bible. The only difference is who it comes from, whether the messenger is from God or from somebody else. The messenger of the Lord now is who it is that is with him, giving him food and drink to sustain him for his journey. So Elijah makes it to the mountain where he is headed, the mountain where he knows he can find God, and he spends the night in a cave, and God's word again comes to him. God begins addressing, or continues addressing Elijah's hearing problem. It asks why he is there, and then it tells him to stand at the entrance to the cave, for God is about to pass by. So Elijah goes out to the entrance of the cave, and amazing, spectacular things happen. Now, with Baal, things were simple. Baal was a storm god. So Baal was heard any time there was lightning or thunder. You knew that Baal was at work. If there was a windstorm or a rainstorm, that's how you knew Baal was active. But with God, the God of Israel, things are a little more hidden. They're not as straightforward as that much of the time. So Elijah stands at the entrance of the cave, and as God is passing by, it's almost like he's getting an object lesson. He's getting uh, some help, tuning his ears so that he can hear the voice of God, so that he can distinguish this voice from those other voices. First, there is a mighty wind, we are told, so strong that it is shattering mountains, breaking rocks, and yet the Lord was not in the wind. And then there's an earthquake, shaking everything to pieces, and yet the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then there is a fire, a raging inferno, and the Lord is not in the fire either. And following that, my translation this morning has it as, there was a quiet whispering 
voice. Some older translations might say a still, small voice. Or the NRSV says the sound of sheer silence. However it's translated, this stands in direct opposition to those, uh, to the, those uh, forces of nature, those displays of power that came just before it. Those displays of power which would be more what you would expect from a storm god but God is not in those. God was bigger than those. God came in silence. And then God speaks to Elijah and recommissions him, sending him back to do God's work, anointing kings and anointing another prophet to take his place when his time has concluded. I think with us, it's much the same way God's voice is that quiet voice. God's words to us aren't as flashy or as big or as impressive as those words we hear around us, those promises we hear in the culture. Those are much more attractive to us than God's promises are. God's promises are so simple, and yet they give more than any of those other promises ever could. Those other promises bring some good things with them, of course, but in the end they do not satisfy. God's promises are the ones that finally bring us through. These promises come to us in simple, everyday ways, in ordinary ways, through messengers or angels that may be our next-door neighbors, that may be one of you speaking to each other. They come to us here in this place, of course, promises of baptism, of being made a child of God, of being given a status that cannot be taken away from you. Promises of holy communion, of Jesus Christ's presence with us, loving us, forgiving us. There are promises of life eternal, promises of resurrection, of grace freely given to those who do not deserve it, oftentimes those who are not even seeking it. These promises come to us and they're quiet and they're easily forgotten. And yet, the more that we hear them, the better that we can listen to them and live by them, the better off we will be, the more our lives will be, and the more we can start living that eternal life here. That word, that voice comes to us and it speaks the same words to us over and over because we have such a hard time hearing. That voice comes to us and it tells us, you are chosen. You are 